one of the issues Rorty is discussing in contingency, irony, and solidarity is the question of the social consequences of a society which consists only of individuals whose worldview, their ideas of the best life for a person, their ideals, goals, projects, and values are limited to the idea or the issue of self-realization and which wouldn't include ideas involving our shared lives and values as members of a community. This is his take on Nietzsche's uh, ideal of the Superman, the Ubermensch. A second issue in the book involves the implications for our self-understanding, given Rorty's view that the self one's core values, one's worldview at any particular point in time is contingent, is historical, is constructed, and it's essentially a language game that has proven to be useful in serving specific human purposes. So whether the language games, the conceptual frameworks by which we understand ourselves and the world around us are provisional and should be discarded to make way for a more useful vocabulary of metaphors or more useful redescriptions of both ourselves and the world are adequate depends essentially on their usefulness. So he describes the history of philosophy as having provided different sets of metaphors in response to these two, two issues issues of what it means to be a person or the self, and issues of what is the nature of the world around us. But these sets of metaphors are merely that, metaphors or language games. So whether they're theories of idealism, realism, uh, philosophical theories, or if they're scientific theories about mechanics or quantum theories, or if they're philosophical accounts of personhood or just our ordinary language games regarding our mental events, our thoughts, our beliefs, our pains, our emotions, they don't mirror reality. None of these sets of metaphors mirror reality. And that's the basis of uh, an earlier book, uh, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. Another similar issue uh, is how well these historical uh, philosophical approaches have been useful in terms of solving real problems. So for example, how well has Plato's notion of the three-part soul, uh, how useful has that been compared to one of its replacements being the psyche in psych psychology for understanding irrational behavior? So my example would be why the free will determinism debate was made, was replaced by modern conceptions of voluntariness and autonomy, which have very specific meanings and consequences for human action. So for example, instead of worrying about whether we're free or determined based on free will and deterministic ideas, voluntariness is uh, contemporarily understood as actions which have reasonable alternatives upon which to act and involuntary actions at another extreme on this continu continuum would be actions for which there are no reasonable alternatives upon which to act and autonomy uh, as a replacement for the free will deterministic categories uh, is contemporarily understood as our capacity for critical self-reflection and these, according to Rorty, if he had discussed these in particular, would be more useful than earlier language games uh, in terms of the Platonic view of the soul or the free will determinism debate in philosophy. Okay, so as an ironist and a pragmatist, Rorty views truth and knowledge in terms of how well a language game serves human purposes and solves real problems. For example, my example, how well does Freud's concept of penis envy explain why women resent men's successes and achievements compared to a philosophical analysis 
or cultural analysis of how patriarchy limits women's successes and achievements. Or here's another example, which theory, which philosophical theory of what justice requires does a better job of explaining injustice in our current historical milieu or solving problems of injustice in this milieu. So Hobbes social contract theory based on metaphors about the state of nature uh, and conclusions drawn about the need for absolute authority, I would argue was well replaced by modern political theories, philosophical theories about basic human rights. Rorty distinguishes between language games oriented towards understanding and developing our private selves. So examples would be our goals, our dreams, our values, our morals, our idealized personal relationships. These are often described in terms of our capacity for self-actualization. And in that respect, they're similar to Nietzsche's Ubermensch metaphor in light of the possibility of self-perfection, self-creation. Compare those types of uh, language games or core values or a person's worldview uh, versus language games that seek to understand ourselves as interdependent members of communities bound by ties of solidarity. Rorty compares the contribution of philosophers like Nietzsche and novelists like Proust and Nabokov in terms of their contributions to our understanding of ourselves as both particular individuals with aims of private perfection or self-actualization and as members of social groups. And in analyzing Proust and Nabokov's no novels, he in particular has an eye to understanding what they have to say about how cruelty can occur, how their characters' cruelty has been shaped by social conditions, and therefore how it can be limited by changing these social conditions. Rorty describes himself as a liberal ironist. And he sees liberals as concerned primarily with decreasing human suffering and cruelty and sees these novels as significant in terms of the details of particular characters, narratives, and the light they shed on the conditions under which they became the, the characters or persons that they became. His criticism of Nietzsche who he also regards as an ironist, perhaps the first ironist philosophy, his criticism is that he, Nietzsche, saw previous worldviews, Enlightenment ideas about reason and freedom, Christianity's ideas about morality as historically based, contingent, and essentially perspectival. And he espoused a theory of perspectivism, which suggests that there are no facts, there are only perspectives. And Nietzsche viewed these uh, views, the Enlightenment views, the Christian views, as essentially motivated by a ruling group's will to power, or the will not to be dominated by, by others. But Nietzsche errs when he switches from being an ironist who recognizes that any language game is metaphorical and doesn't correspond to reality and switching to metaphysical theories about a transcendent reality. In particular, his theory of the sublime as an understanding of the holy other. So, for Rorty, metaphysical theories are merely redescriptions that are contingent, provisional, and replaceable, have no special standing. Let's say no special ontological standing, that these redescriptions correspond to reality. Um, yet his own theory about the Ubermensch does have a metaphysical non-contingent element in the notion of the sublime, the holy other. And this is exemplified by the boundary crossing Superman, the Ubermensch, in ways 
similar described similarly to the god Dionysius. Although the experiences that led Nietzsche to believe in the sublime, to believe in human divinity, were also perspectives resulting from his own uh, historical contingency. Another criticism of Nietzsche as an ironist uh, is based on Nietzsche's unwillingness to accept the inadequacy of his own theory, the replaceability of his own theory, theory of the Ubermensch, the will to power, as characterized as self-referential, his own experiences of power, oppression, and self-limitations, their own contingency, provisionality, and replaceability. Yet he believed his final vocabulary, his particular worldview, was one that everyone at all times should accept as their own final vocabulary, including the values, the goals, and the, their core beliefs. Rorty describes Nietzsche's goal to provide a historicist, perspectivist account of his predecessors, the Greek philosophers, Enlightenment philosophers, who assumed that they had discovered a metaphysical reality and not just uh, a perspective on it, uh, a metaphysical reality of essences, substances, rationality, but he failed to recognize he was making the same metaphysical mistake in his ideas of the Ubermensch, the will to power, and his view of history as having a, necess as having a necessity uh, independent of chance. This, according to Rorty, explains why Nietzsche seems to contradict himself so frequently. In Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, Nietzsche looks to fiction for better because more detailed descriptions of what it means to be a human, what it means to be a person, and how particular social institutions can make a huge difference in terms of our development because these novels, for example, Proust, provide redescriptions and characterizations filled with details, concrete details, about the protagonist and other characters over specific periods of time. And therefore, these novels provide insight into the way contingency, good and bad luck, can affect different characters differently instead of a philosophical approach that wants to define human nature according to a single rationality, uh, a single standard, a historical standard, whether it's rationality, the will to power, or uh, persons as being naturally oriented toward the common good, Aquinas' the theory of natural law. But the problem with regard to novelists like Proust in their descriptions of how social class distinctions and social institutions can impact a person's character, these novels typically don't provide a framework that offers insight into a solution to these political problems. Although he does provide insight, I'm talking about Proust, into how social institutions can support cruel behavior in particular individuals. For example, he cites Nabokov's novel Lolita, the protagonist of Lolita having a private obsession and social sexual relationship with a 12-year-old girl, itself based in, supported by the social conditions of his time and his particular membership in a specific social class. We can ask ourselves, how do contemporary political and social institutions support cruelty? According to some recent social science research, one conclusion made by the researchers that is that as individuals achieve more power, including political power, they become less empathetic. And we can be reminded of another significant pragmatist, John Dewey, who argued that democracy requires social interaction among different social classes in order to achieve social justice and diminish cruelty. Here's a quote 
about Nietzsche's worldview from Rorty, page 105, quote, to try for the sublime is to try to make a pattern out of the entire realm of possibility, not just out of some little contingent actualities, unquote. So in his comparisons of Plato and Kant, who took the idea of the sublime outside of time, Plato's uh, ideas, forms, essences regarding goodness, justice, beauty, Kant's I, a priori categories such as causation, in contrast to these philosophers who understood the sublime and the absolute as outside of time, Rorty mentions uh, Nietzsche views himself as separated from the rest of time by a decisive event. Um, in contrast, Proust used time to better describe a character's development over time. So he was understanding human beings and personhood uh, in terms of specific time frames. Oh, so when Rorty mentions the replacement of Cartesian dualism in the resolution of the subject-object gap, um, by such an event, philosophical event, as phenomenology, which attempted to resolve that gap, he discusses that decisive event as happening to Nietzsche as a basis for uh, constructing his own philosophy. He was no longer thinking in terms of the mind-body problem. But when we view events in this way, as Rorty does, as decisive turns, of events, uh, in terms of world history, instead of the history of philosophy, examples, examples of such decisive unsettling events and their resulting redescriptions or uh, different metaphors and understandings, we can understand the carnage created by the two world wars as the events that led to a recognition of universal basic human rights. And we can hypothesize now that a nuclear war would result in a replacement of our current perspective on what a just war might entail. Other contemporary philosophers, Alain Badiou, for example, theorize that it will take a major catastrophic event to enable ideological views to be replaced because while they're held to be true, ideologues can't view themselves as thinking ideologically, that is, as having worldviews that either aren't supported by facts or can't be falsified. Similarly, Rorty argues that Nietzsche's discussion of the Ubermensch does not view this being, the Superman, the Ubermensch, as a contingent result of circumstances, but as, quote, pure self-creation, pure spontaneity. And this explains why philosophers have regarded Nietzsche as an inverted Platonist, given his conceptions of the absolute and the sublime. Rorty analyzes various language games in order to determine how useful they have been, in particular, how they have helped create better persons. My example, whether the language of satanic evil has done a better job to create better persons than the psychological concepts of sociopathy, psychosis, and paranoia. He concludes in his theories, he concludes that theories about persons having intrinsic value haven't been useful or useful enough. My example, Kant's view of persons as having dignity because of our rationality which is the basis of our intrinsic value, hasn't been useful enough, given the egregious affronts to human dignity in the form of genocide. And uh, Rorty argues that analytical philosophy hasn't done uh, much that's useful because it understands knowledge in terms of uh, units like sentences and the relationship among units like sentences instead of a holistic way in terms of the context. In being an ironist like Nietzsche, 
Vardy sees that the particular conceptual framework he's espousing, his political framework is a liberal, may have replaced his previous views about the world and persons uh, with his current one, but at the time of holding previous uh, worldviews, having previous final vocabularies, he's also uh, concerned as a liberal with the issues of what conditions need to be in place in order to produce the type of political and social communities that would be optimal in eliminating human suffering and misery and in achieving uh, solidarity amongst, among its members. In addition, he argues that if a person's own metaphors, his own final vocabulary, would include how he or she perceives her childhood, redescribes her childhood, her psychological development, her conception of the ideal person. If, they, if a person's own private vocabulary is solely based on private goals of self-creation and not public goals of mutuality or mutual adaptation, this will be a problem as far as achieving solidarity as a means for eliminating cruelty and diminishing human suffering. To do this, a person's final vocabulary can't be limited to his views about self-creation because its implications for justice are unclear. I would argue that a philosopher like Martha Nussbaum, whose final vocabulary consisted of a description of human capabilities and the ideal for personhood being the optimal development of one's human capabilities does have political implications because she argues that the state should support everyone in terms of developing maxim maximally their specific uh, capabilities. So the coincidence of a private vocabulary limited to private goals with a vocabulary that includes public ones will be accidental because everyone has a different set of blind impressions, impresses, the effects of one's childhood and adolescent experiences. For example, if a person's childhood and early adolescence included a fear of starving, this could result in that person's empathy with other starving people. And if one had a personal experience with murder, that would shape a person's view on criminal justice. My example, if one's childhood experiences included the experience of uninhabited land, and as a source of spirituality, peace, and freedom, one would have a different worldview about the value of an uninhabited, pristine landscape uh, compared to one who experienced very little of the natural world and uh, lived primarily in a city like New York with its bustling, Con uh, commercial and financial landscape and might see uninhabited land as a uh, opportunity for a commercial investment. In conclusion, any person's final vocabulary, whether it's private or public, is contingent on certain historical and personal circumstances which gave rise to them. And being an ironist means you view your current worldview as the best in terms of support, but may eventually be replaced given it replaced earlier conceptions of what it means to be a good person or what it means to live in a good society. But if a personal or cultural commonly held worldview contains only ideas about personal self-creation and perfection, it will fall short of achieving the solidarity essential to creating communities concerned with eliminating social misery and personal suffering.